Hello and welcome to this live Bailey Gifford webinar. I'm Natalie Breen and I'll be hosting today's broadcast. We're going to be delving into the Keystone Positive Change Investment Trust and exploring how we invest for a better future. To do this, I'm joined by Rosie Rankin, a director from Bailey Gifford and instrumental on the Positive Change team. Rosie will help to shed light on the new strategy for the trust, the new name and how it's positioned for the future. Before we delve into all of that, though, a little bit of housekeeping from me for the session. I'm going to interview Rosie directly and then I'll be putting your questions to her. So if you have any questions, you can submit them at any time via the chat box. I will monitor your questions and put them to Rosie at the last section of the show. So Rosie, thank you so much for joining me, particularly thank you for joining me in person. It's really lovely to have you in the studio. Delighted to be here, so thank, thank you. you. Let's dive straight in. So the backstory for Keystone really begins in the mid 30s and is rooted in the history of the city titans of its time. But however, recently the trust in its current form has really just emerged. Could you give us a bit of an insight into this monumental step change? Yes, happy to. It's been a tremendously exciting period for the Trust. And it really was the board of Keystone who had the vision to move from their previous UK equity mandate to a global mandate. But what's more importantly, a global mandate that also included sustainability as core part of its philosophy. So they commenced a search for a manager who shared their vision back in 2020. And we were absolutely delighted to be appointed to that mandate. And we took on the management of the trust in February of this year. So now the trust has two equally important objectives. So to generate attractive investment returns and to contribute towards a more sustainable world. And to do that, we invest in 30 to 60 companies, a mixture of public and private companies across our four impact themes, which are social inclusion and education, environment and resource needs, healthcare and quality of life, and base of the pyramid. Now I'm often asked what base <laughs> of the pyramid is, and it's really looking for companies who help to meet the needs of those at the very bottom of the global income ladder. So incredibly, there's still around 4 billion people in the world who are on less than $3,000 a year. So it, it's companies who are helping that group of the population to participate economically. I'm sure we'll come into to, to, to exploring the base of the pyramid in a little bit more detail, because I think it probably needs a bit more time. But could you talk to us a bit about the philosophy of the trust overall? Yes, absolutely. So. In terms of the underpinning philosophy of the trust, it's all about our deep rooted belief that um, capital can be a tremendously powerful mechanism for change. And when you look at the world today, there are undoubtedly a lot of challenges that mm. need tackling, whether that's um, the climate crisis or global poverty or social inclusion. Now, all those challenges sound very depressing. But at Billy Gifford, we're optimists and we believe that through human ingenuity and innovation, we can really help to tackle those challenges and tackling those challenges brings investment opportunity. Because if we can find companies whose products and services really help to meet those challenges, then they should be good long term growth opportunities. People should want to buy the products and services that they produce. They'll benefit from loyal customers and they'll attract talent because people want a job with purpose. And I think the, the final bit of our philosophy I would emphasize is the fact that we're really long term. Mm. Now, I think that's particularly important when you think about investing for impact, because sadly, none of the challenges I mentioned are going to be solved over the next quarter or the next 12 months. You know, when you're thinking about these big systemic global challenges, you really need to think with a multi-year time horizon. So within Keystone Positive Change, we're very long-term patient investors. 
One of the things um, that you talk about when it, in, in relation to positive change is that sometimes the public doesn't really see the positive effects that the companies you invest in have on society and, and the globe as a whole. Why is that? And can you give us some examples of these companies that are doing force for good? Yes, um, you're absolutely right, Natalie, because some of the companies in the portfolio have a very obvious impact. Um, for example, it's now a household name, Moderna, mm. which of course is familiar to us all through the COVID, COVID vaccine it produces. But there are other companies which have a profound impact that you know, we may perhaps have never heard of. And a good example here is Xylem. It's a US company which makes water infrastructure products such as um, pipes and pumps and also smart water systems, which allow us to be much more efficient in our use of water. Now, of course, the end users of Xylem's products have no idea when they turn on their tap that um, they are behind the kind of efficiency of their water system. But, you know, overall, um, Xylem has helped to save over 456 billion litres of water um, last calendar year. So it's making a significant impact. And then there are other companies in the portfolio which don't have an obvious impact because we would classify them as enablers. Mm -hmm. And a really good example here is the innovative Dutch company ASML, which um, produces um, machines which are crucial in the manufacture of um, semiconductors. Now, ASML's leading edge technologies have allowed um, semiconductors to become ever quicker and cheaper and more energy efficient, you know, powering innovation across a range of different industries from um, healthcare to, to digital education. But yet their contribution is often underappreciated because they're enabling others. But you know, that's the company type of company that, that really excites us. Mm. So it's not that you're us. just going for the, the wind farm as it were, or um, yeah, the, the, the healthcare operators themselves, it's really the inner workings underneath that. Yes, really what we're looking for in the cha in, within positive change are those companies that are enabling change, that, mm. that are really the, the wave makers, if you like, rather than the wave riders. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's mm. a great an analogy for it. And I suppose all of your, your holdings within the portfolio at the moment are examples of people that are really pushing, not so much innovation, but pushing change, do you think? Yes, yes. And that's very much the, the philosophy that you're wanting these companies. And it's through the products and services mm. that they produce as well. That's where we're wanting to see them drive change. So is it about um, affecting people's behaviour as well within society and, and towards the products that they're creating? Yes, because I think it recognises that really the products, the success of the products are very tied into the investment case as well. Mm. So we're always looking for that synergy between what will allow a company to drive forward change and improve the status quo but something that people actually want to purchase and buy because it's got to improve their lives as well. They've mm -hmm. got to recognise the need for it. Uh, a really good example here within the portfolio would be Dexcom, which produces continuous glucose monitoring mm -hmm. systems for diabetics. Now, um, their um, monitors do away with the need for finger prick testing, for example. And they also make it much easier for carers of diabetics to monitor their glucose levels remotely. Tremendously beneficial, for example, if you have a child with, with diabetes. Now, we can see there that there's a real reason why people would want to buy their monitors. Um, built into the investment case is that expectation that they will expand their patient population over the coming years. So you can see there a really strong link between the positive change that Dexcom is driving and then their ability to generate attractive investment returns as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. You've touched on COVID and I'm sure you've had to talk and present on this a lot, but we can't ignore it. The fact that it's obviously had incredible global chaos, but how has it impacted your portfolios and, and, and how has it or has it impacted the trends and themes that you believe in? Yes, I mean, undoubtedly, as you say, Natalie, uh, COVID has affected us 
or yeah, not to minimise it. I say yeah. it talks about it a lot, mm, but, but it, it, it's it's so prevalent. It is so prevalent, and it has certainly impacted the portfolio across all four of our themes. Mm. And actually, in many areas, it has almost been it has almost accelerated progress, and change that we thought might have taken years has happened in a much shorter time frame. Wow. So, for example, we invest in Teladoc which is a provider of digital healthcare. Now, when we took that position in Teladoc, it was long before um, COVID, but we were working on the thesis that over the coming years, that actually virtual medical appointments would start to play an increasingly prevalent role. Now, of course, during COVID, we saw a massive increase in the number of patients and physicians using Teladoc's services. And so we saw a, a real acceleration in growth there. But we think that that trend isn't going to be reversed, that whilst people will start to have in-person medical appointments, um, virtual medical appointments will be here to stay as well and, and play an important part in providing access to medical um, professionals. But it wasn't just in our healthcare theme, because that's a kind of obvious one when you're thinking about COVID. It was across um, companies, for example, within social inclusion and education. So companies in particular that help pivot um, offline merchants online. So companies such as Shopify mm -hmm. or Mercado Libre, um, the Latin American um, e-commerce platform. So yes, tremendous progress. Um, over the last 18 months, but much of that progress will be here to stay. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how it's kind of spurred people on to, to, to create and innovate quickly under pressure. Mm -hmm. ESG and sustainable investing are obviously front and centre of, of investors' minds now more than ever, not yeah. just because of COP26 happening and this, this being such a decisive decade for us all. And it's clearly core to your investment approach. But how do you differentiate your application of investing sustainably to that of other strategies? Yes, so I think, I think there's a few things to bring out here. Uh, firstly, is our positive starting point. I think often many ESG strategies start off by thinking about exclusions, so what they're not going to invest in. So whether that's particular types of companies or a particular sector such as tobacco. Now, for us, an exclusionary approach can be a, a reasonable way of mitigating ESG risk and for signalling that you're aligning your investment with your values. But in terms of really tackling the world's challenges, I think it has limitations. So, for example, what would you not invest in to increase access to transformative health care? Or what would you mm. exclude from your portfolio to accelerate the economic development of those um, poorest communities in the world? So instead of thinking about what we're not going to invest in, it's very much a positive, proactive approach. And I've already mentioned this, but I think it's probably worth emphasising again. The second point is that we're very long term but also crucially forward looking. So when we invest in companies, it's not on the basis of backward looking ESG data. It's really looking forward to think about the impact that companies can drive over the years ahead. So absolutely core to our approach is bottom up fundamental research, because I think it's only by looking ahead to the changes that you want to see in the future that you'll really make a difference. And then the third point of differentiation that I was going to bring out for Keystone in particular is our ability to invest in private companies. So we can invest up to 30% of the portfolio in private companies. Now, to be clear, it's going to take us years to get anywhere near that level, but we've made a, a good start this year. There are currently three companies comprising about 2% of the portfolio um, that we've invested in. And private companies are exciting, first of all, because you have impact as a shareholder because you're providing primary capital. But secondly, that's really where your 
seeing much of the, the innovation that could really help um, drive change in the decades ahead. So yes, for all of those reasons, um, we really feel that Keystone has quite a differentiated approach. Mm. Can you talk about some of those private companies that, that you're invested in and, and, how, and how you've found them? Yes, well, we're very fortunate at Bailey Gifford because we have a, a large um, private companies team and indeed many of the investment trusts that we manage at Bailey Gifford invest in private companies. So there is a rich source of research there that we've been able to, to tap into and expand on in terms of looking at the impact of those companies as well. So to give you a, a couple of examples, we've invested in Northvolt, which is um, a Swedish manufacturer of electric vehicle batteries. Mm -hmm. So obviously the, the growth case there is clear as the uh, adoption of electric vehicles um, ex accelerates, sorry, excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a completely different type of company in a completely different area of the world. We've invested in Spiber, which is a Japanese company. Um, that's active in synthetic biology. So that technology where you take engineering techniques and apply it to biology. Now, Spiber produce fibres that can be used as an alternative to um, uh, kind of both natural fibres such as cashmere, but also fibres derived from petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. So the, the, again, the impact that they could have in being able to mitigate some of the effects of fast fashion that we see is really exciting over the, the years ahead. So um, yes, we're very excited about the opportunities we're seeing within private companies. Staying with, with companies, which holdings do you have, if any, are kind of addressing the climate crisis that we're facing at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yes, so one of our explicit themes within Keystone is environment and mm. resource needs. So within that, there are some companies that you can see are very directly um, helping that transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. So a company uh, such as Ørsted, which is the world's uh, largest provider of offshore wind power, for example. But we need to think more broadly about that because if we're thinking about companies that are generating renewable energy, we need to think about storing that energy that's produced, which is where um, battery uh, companies such as Tesla, of course, has, um, is, a, is a leader in developing battery technologies. And I've mentioned Northvolt mm -hmm. already. And then when we're thinking about how to tackle climate, as a society, we also need to think about doing more with less. So we invest in companies such as Novozymes, which produce um, enzymes. Now, uh, the kind of um, probably the most familiar use of enzymes to you or I would be in the use of washing powder, for example, and use of enzymes allows you to wash laundry at, at lower temperatures but actually enzymes have applications across lots of different industries and sectors, um, including, for example, agriculture. And that brings me to something that we've put a lot of thought into within um, Keystone Positive Change, thinking about that challenge that we have to make sure that the world's growing population has access to plentiful, cheap and nutritious food, mm -hmm. but also being very conscious of the environmental impact of feeding the world's growing population. And so it's in areas such as that, that um, through our own research and through working with academics, um, we've identified companies which we think are helping us to do that. So for example, we invest in Beyond Meat which uh, delicious. Delicious. I'm glad you've had a, a Beyond Meat <laughs> burger or um, so yes, that's really acknowledging that um, we need to find alternative sources of, of protein alongside animal meat. Mm -hmm. So um, Beyond Meat's um, plant based protein products are are part of that solution. And then also um, companies that allow us to be um, much more mindful of the environment um, 
during in intensive agriculture. So, for example, we invest in deer, the manufacturer of agricultural equipment. And the reason that we're really enthusiastic about deer is their precision agriculture technology, which has cameras and sensors on the front of their machines, which allow you to be much more precise in how you apply chemicals and pesticides. Mm, so you're avoiding the, the natural flowers and headlands around the fields for biodiversity. Yes, yes, absolutely. So it can um, help in terms of preserving biodiversity. It also um, allows you to reduce pesticide use, for example, by, eight, by about 80%. So it reduces costs for farmers. So again, you can see that there is a reason for adoption and it increases yields. So there is a really um, compelling reason why we think precision agriculture should have a positive impact, but also grow. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a, a few more questions from me before um, we move on to audience questions. So if you have anything that you would like to submit, now's your time to do it. Um, from me, though, before, before we move on to the audience questions, we've talked a lot about how you invest into companies, but let's look a little bit at the flip side of that and talk about what's your discipline when it comes to actually selling companies. Yes. So in terms of buying companies, companies have to meet both of our objectives. So companies have to offer the potential for attractive investment returns and contribute towards a more sustainable world. And our sell discipline is the exact mirror of that. We will sell a company if we lose conviction in its ability to deliver attractive investment returns. And also if, if we start to have diminished conviction in their ability to achieve the level of impact that we hoped they would have. Um, since we took over the, the management of Keystone, we've sold two companies from the portfolio. So over the summer, we sold a company called Glaucos, which is a, a US-based company. They manufacture tiny stents that go into your eye to relieve the, the pressure of glaucoma. Um, but we hadn't really seen the level of investment returns that we hoped to see with um, Glaucos. There had been much stronger competition in the um, kind of novel therapeutics for glaucoma. So we took the decision to sell. So that was very much sold on investment grounds. Mm -hmm. um, the other company that we sold out of is Alphabet, a much better known company. Um, we, within the broader positive change strategy, had owned that for a number of years, really because of the impact it was having in terms of offering access to the internet to over 2 billion people through Android and Chrome, um, many of whom were in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. But um, in the round, um, we felt perhaps that part of the impact story had played out. We were a little bit underwhelmed by the progress in some of their other bets areas of, of the business. And also there were some lingering concerns around business practices. Um, and we couldn't really see the progress there that we were hoping for, so, so took the decision to sell out. So that was perhaps more a decision, although there was an investment um, aspect to that, more on impact grounds. Mm. So hopefully two different examples Absolutely. of the sell discipline in, in action. So how, do, how does it come down then when you're looking at the impact of these companies? How do you actually measure that? How do you measure and report on positive change and positive impact. Oh, yeah. Because that could be so ephemeral. It must be so hard to actually drill down and pin it down to like, yes, this is this is what we think is positive. Yes, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. We're very aware that when you run a trust that has two objectives, it's really important to report on both that kind of investment returns aspect, mm -hmm. which is very straightforward to report on. Yes, and you can have it, it in your spreadsheet. And you have it in your spreadsheet and there's numerous sources of data that will tell you actually that's what your share price yeah. has done. Whereas, um, of course, reporting on impact can be much more subjective, although equally important. So um, shareholders within Keystone can expect to receive an annual impact report. We'll be publishing the first one next year. And within that report, we will go through every single company within the portfolio and it's bespoke metrics for each company because it's almost impossible to have a single metric 
that would be suitable yeah, for an innovative biotech a semiconductor <laughs> to a, a plant-based burger. They're not the same beast. <laughs> <laughs> not the same beast at all. But we do report on them in the same format. So within our impact reporting, we use a, a logic model um, based on the theory of change. And so for each company, we are looking at actually what are the inputs to the company in terms of financial and human capital? What does the company actually do? So, for example, in the case of Ursted, which I mentioned, the renewable energy company, your um, uh, primary activity is um, offshore wind production. But then you ask yourself, well, how much of that activity they do? So how much, uh, what, what's their output? But then crucially, what does that mean in terms of short term short term outcome, how many, what's the quantity of CO2 emissions they're helping to avoid? Because that starts to get them to the nub of what the impact is. Now that's just a short term impact because it's how many, the quantity of CO2 emissions that they've avoided over the course of a calendar year. Importantly for us, we also want to think about the longer term systemic impact, which is where we map to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which we've found to be a really useful framework. And we do that mapping exercise um, at uh, underlying target levels. So there are 169 targets underpinning the Sustainable Development Goals. So we very carefully map a company's impact to those underlying targets. But um, you're right, it, it's challenging. Yes. <laughs> you're very um, reliant as well on, on companies disclosing the data that you need. And of, of course, sometimes the, the most important impacts are immeasurable. For example, with an education company, you can measure the number of students that take their courses, but it's almost impossible to quantify actually what impact has had on their has that had on their lives mm. in terms of improving their kind of future employability and prospects and it's almost the immeasurable aspects that are really key to our case but we've got to be comfortable that we can't measure everything mm. but that you can make a strong argument for it yes absolutely mm. um, Finally, for me then, where to from here? You're nearing the end of your, your first year in inception. So what's on the horizon for the Keystone Positive Change Trust? Yes. I, Can you believe it? I, I know, mean, it's I been a whirlwind of a year. Um, yes, it, it has been such an honour to take on the management of the trust. And it's really been uh, you know, a period of transition in the trust in terms of establishing the initial portfolio, making those initial investments in private companies, um, introducing gearing for the trust as well. Looking ahead, as I said, shareholders can expect to see an impact report next year. But I think kind of most importantly, we're really enthusiastic about the pipeline of ideas we have for the portfolio. Uh, I've touched a few on a few of them briefly, but you know, in terms of thinking about the world's transition, um, in terms of our energy usage. And it won't just be in terms of electrification, you know, other alternative fuels, whether that's biofuels or hydrogen will also have a role to play. It's about thinking about the tremendous advances that as a society we're making in the understanding of human biology mm -hmm. and the investment opportunities there are, you know, just such a rich pipeline of ideas for the strategy. Um, and then, not to forget areas that are absolutely critical, such as education and thinking about companies that can help facilitate access to education and really importantly, help support um, millions of workers who will be facing the need to reskill as the job market changes over the decades ahead, um, whether that's through the introduction of AI or um, other kind of societal changes that we'll see. So. I think, um, yes, very optimistic Absolutely. about the, the opportunities that we have for the portfolio. Super. Thank you, Rosie. Those are all my questions. So we're going to turn to some audience questions that have been submitted. Thank you to you all for, for sending them in. I'm going to start with one here. It says, hi, would you be kind enough to say how the fund has been trimmed to navigate in a high inflation scenario such as the one we're facing now? 
If so, which changes have been made so far? Thanks in advance. Thank you for that, asking that so nicely. Yes, yes I know. know. <laughs> a, a lovely question. Um, so really in terms of what you can expect to see within Keystone positive change is that we don't really take that macro view of making short term changes to the portfolio in response to, uh, for example, inflation um, prospects. Instead, we remain resolutely focused on the long term because that's going to be the real drivers for the, the portfolio. So addressing those big challenges. Now, having said that, we don't completely ignore macro um, because of course it could have implications for the individual companies in which we invest, in which case you, we do focus in on how high inflation could affect individual companies, but we don't make any changes at the portfolio level like that. Thank you. Another one that says, could, which we haven't really touched on much yet, could you please tell us more about your engagement practices and do you have any examples? Yes, absolutely. Um, so engagement is really important for us because um, we have a concentrated portfolio. We own these companies for the long term. And we also think that's also how we can have an impact because for many of these companies, it's really important to have long term supportive shareholders. So how we think about engagement is that at the start of every year, we um, look at all the companies in the portfolio and devise an engagement priority list, looking at the companies and thinking, actually, what's the key issues we want to engage with on those with those companies? How do we want to, to find out? Um, what do we want to find out? What do we want to influence? And of course, during the course of the year, there's flexibility because issues may come up that um, require addressing. So we would aim to speak to every company within the portfolio once on roughly about an 18 month basis, often much more than, than once, but that's a, as a minimum. And issues that we've engaged on this year so far have been, for example, on with Tesla, um, on their impact reporting and their um, uh, kind of an enhancement of their own impact reporting and data. Um, we have um, engaged with companies such as FDM, which is a recruitment and training company, around um, the, the practices of the level of wages that they're paying um, trainees on their recruitment programme. So yes, a wide range of engagement. And I think one thing that's really important in terms of our approach to engagement is that I'm often asked what did you see bad at a company and what did you engage on and how did it change mm. um, and we do do that but often actually i think the role we can play as well is that of a supportive shareholder i think the power of being supportive is often underestimated mm. you know, we are investing in 35 or so companies who we actually really admire and think are exceptional and often i think our value can be that being that supportive shareholder, encouraging them to stay true to their long-term strategic vision, encouraging them not to worry about short-term quarterly results, but instead to stay the course, to keep investing in research and development, for example, and really stay focused on the future. And um, again, that's a very, I think, difficult one to evidence <laughs> yeah absolutely um well, but I think it goes it's... kind of unsaid doesn't it it kind of plays into the theme of the fact that the companies that you're investing in are, are, are wave makers for change and yet we often don't see the effects that they have in the same way that you guys are obviously pushing for not so much change but supporting change yeah. and supporting their activities towards it but it kind of goes unnoticed yes so uh, but to the wider public i suppose well yes so I think, um, but I think that's a really important part of the engagement mix, as well as, of course, you can, you know, there's, I, I don't think we've come across a perfect company. <laughs> there will always be some aspect that you think, oh, actually, you yeah. need to change that. Yeah, but, I suppose, you know, certainly from a journalist point of view, we're always looking to swoop in on the stories of like, where did you see something wrong? How did you change it? Tell mm -hmm. us about it. But actually, I guess it can be more impactful to just be sitting on the same side as, as the company is saying, let's keep going, let's keep pushing ahead. Yes, yes, yes. We're, you know, if um, an investment in the future 
comes at the expense of short-term results, mm -hmm. that is fine because we want you to be a long-term <laughs> growth company. Absolutely. So it's absolutely being true to that vision. A little bit of a step change. We've had um, quite a few questions kind of um, about the structure, I suppose. And one is, what are the key differences between the fund and the trust? Can you shed a little bit of light on that? Yes. So one of the differences is in terms of the stock range. So in terms of the fund, it is 25 to 50. In terms of the trust, it's 30 to 60. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason for that um, kind of larger stock range, it's still very concentrated, is because the trust critically has the ability to invest in private companies. So up to 30% of the trust can be in private companies. The fund is purely listed companies. There is also gearing. So um, currently the trust has about 5% gearing in place and the fund has uh, no gearing. Um, and then the trust can also invest slightly further down the market cap spectrum. So um, minimum market cap for the fund is about a billion dollars and it's half that for the trust, so 500 million. So you could expect to see um, some smaller companies in there as well. But at the core, you know, identical philosophy mm -hmm. and um, there's much more similarities, but you know, some really um, key differences there. Fab. Um, we've got one question from an eagle-eyed viewer that says, could you tell me a bit more about your base of the pyramid theme and the opportunity there? Because we didn't actually delve into that when you touched on it at the beginning. So here's, here's your time. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yes. So this is a theme. It, it, it's important. It's really important to us. It is a theme where we've struggled to find uh, ideas. So it's really looking for those companies who are helping to meet the needs of those at the very bottom of the global income ladder. And we are uncompromising in terms of our search for companies that, that will generate attractive investment returns and have that positive impact. So two companies that we think will achieve that uh, within base of the pyramid are Bank Rakyat, which is an Indonesian bank and a large provider of um, microfinance and micro savings products within Indonesia. So really helping facilitate um, financial participation in you know, a country where still around about a third of the population is unbanked. And then we also have Safaricom, which is a Kenyan provider of mobile telecommunications. But the reason that we really like um, Safaricom is that they have a mobile payments platform called M-Pesa, which it operates just on, it's very simple technology, SMS uh, on mobile phones, so you don't need a smartphone. And again, allows um, people to be financially included in a country which lacks a, um, a kind of extensive banking infrastructure in the traditional sense. So it's those types of companies where you can really see them having that kind of direct impact on kind of enabling entrepreneurship and enabling um, financial inclusion that we really want to see within base of the pyramid. And uh, there's a number of companies that we're, we're currently looking at, which will hopefully um, go in alongside those two. Fab, so plans, plans for next year. Yes, mm. yes, absolutely. It's a really um, active area of, of research for us as well. I think we have time for one one or two more. Um, we've got one here. What are the key challenges you face as investors in positive change companies? Yes, so I think, um, to, to, to be honest, one of the, the key challenges we face is almost that challenge that I talked about earlier, that there is no perfect company. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you often have, when you're looking holistically at a company, you're making that judgment um, about, is this company on the whole driving change? So a really sort of simple example is Ørsted, the renewable energy producer, still has a portion of its revenue from coal-fired um, power generation. Now they're divesting from that, but um, it's almost mentally easier to net off to environmental um, want a benefit, um, want a detractor. Mm. But then you have companies such as Bank Rakyat in um, Indonesia, which I mentioned. Now we can see really clear social benefits from their banking and microfinance products. 
but on the flip side of that, a portion of their loan book is involved in financing palm oil production, for example, and we know the negative environmental consequences uh, of that. So how do you net off a positive social contribution with a negative environmental one? And it comes back to that fundamental research. So I think that's definitely a, a challenge, but you, we want to be really transparent in how we're thinking about companies. Um, Absolutely. Um, we do have time for one, one more. Yes, okay. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, what did you take from COP and, and how is that playing into your portfolio? Yeah, so I, I think um, COP kind of confirmed the direction of travel that we were already, you know, very aware of in the portfolio in terms of Know, that this is a climate crisis and certainly I think one thing we saw at COP was that change in use of language it's gone from being about climate change to climate crisis which Absolutely. is probably the right way to to think about it and I think it's really just allowed us to focus on the companies that we think are helping us to meet the climate crisis so whether that's companies I've already mentioned um, in terms of renewable energy or using resources more efficiently but also across the portfolio as a whole, it has really given further impetus to us focusing on companies' own climate commitments within the portfolio. Uh, so exploring with our underlying portfolio companies what their own climate commitments are in terms of have they made a commitment to be net zero aligned themselves? Are they disclosing scope one, scope two, scope three? Um, emissions. So really kind of, yes, confirming the direction of travel that we were already on um, and really, you know, I think highlighting the urgency of doing so as well. Absolutely. Well, Rosie, I think that's all we've got time for now. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and join me in the studio and for sharing your insights. It's been really fascinating and wishing you lots of luck for the, the year ahead. Oh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it. And thank you to everybody for watching and for all of your questions. This is one of many Bailey Gifford webinars. So if you enjoyed today, do check the website to watch further. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye.